If you know your history, it's hard not to feel there are parallels with the 1930s at the moment. The authoritarianism on the rise, a war in Europe, a hostile power in our region, plus an energy crisis threatening to literally send us back to the Dark Ages. These are issues the West has faced before, but never have our values been more skewed or our leadership been so poor. Shadow Defence Minister Andrew Hastie was in Washington last week to deliver a major speech on the US-Australia alliance on the one-year anniversary of AUKUS. And as only good allies can do, Andrew Hastie didn't mince his words. The toxins are in the mainstream now, seeping through the media, in entertainment, in our schools and in our families. It has brought disruption and this has political consequences for the Western body politic. And he didn't stop there, suggesting the United States has not developed a grand strategy necessary to inspire confidence amongst allies, including Australia, telling his DC audience they've got to act urgently. The United States must develop a grand strategy that outlasts congressional and presidential election, electoral cycles and that can weather the worst of any domestic political disagreements. Andrew Hastie joins us now from our Parliament House studio in Canberra. Andrew, welcome. A tough speech, hard to disagree with any of your assessments or the urgency of what you warned. How did it go down with your US audience? Good evening, Peter. Good to be with you. I think it was well received. I think uh, friends value honesty and what I was trying to do is be honest and give some feedback and say in a world that is getting more strategically challenging for many of the US's allies, we want to see a strong US, a US that is leading and doing so with confidence. And they need to really look hard at how they can build a new social and moral consensus back home, which will then help them project abroad. You talked about the, the toxic values fight, and I'm 100% with you. I mean, others call it the culture wars. You say, let's get back to basics. Let's talk about tax and welfare and foreign policy. Again, I agree with you, but it's not the centre-right that's pushing all this self-hate, is it? It's the hard left. And if I was critical of, of the right on this, I'd say it's taken the right too long to get in the ring on some of these issues. You know, we should be fighting harder on values. You're not suggesting, are you, that the right vacate the field? What's the point? No, absolutely not. I'm, I'm absolutely not <laughs> suggesting that at all. I, I'm suggesting that we go back to our values, go back to the values that have stood the test of time as our, as our anchor for going forward. Uh, we, we must prevail in this contest with authoritarian powers. And the way we do that is through having strong, self-confident values. And the problem with the left at the moment is that they don't believe in a lot of the Western values that have built our democracies. And that's a big, big problem. So I, I, I asked the question in the speech, um, if we can't agree on basic definitions of gender, even, how, po how can we possibly mm. do national strategy that, that outlasts, as I said, electoral cycles? You're so right. I mean, I made the point at the top of the introduction, you know, this feels a lot like the history we saw play out in the 1930s. But back then we sort of knew who we were. And you looked at the, the leadership, the calibre of people like Churchill and FDR. We had some pretty amazing people in the positions that matter. It's hard to feel as confident now as perhaps we could then. And John Curtin, let's not forget um, Menzies, then John Curtin in, in Australia back Curtin. home, who, who did great things as, as, as leaders of our country. Uh, look, let's not, let's not gloss over history, though. There were very, very strident debates. And I think it was the Oxford Union itself which, which voted to, um, you know, for appeasement. They supported the, the British policy, the policy of appeasement prior to the Second World War. So um, there's always a contest at the heart of democracy and, and debate is what we do. Uh, but when we, we can't even dis when we can't even agree on basic questions like gender, mm. then that does pose problems for other areas of our lives together in domestic policy and foreign policy and defence policy, which is what I'm really concerned about because, as I've said many times before, the strategic situation for Australia in the Indo-Pacific region is deteriorating and we need to take actions to protect ourselves over the next decade and beyond. Right, you were always ahead of the curve on China. What did you make of reports today in The Australian that they're prepared to meet us halfway, that there's a bit of an olive 
uh, branch, uh, if Penny Wong was picking up the phone and asking you for advice, should we trust them? Well, let's wait and see. It's, it's always got to come back to what's in it for us and our national interest. And in the end, the 14 uh, point uh, demands or the 14 demands that they, they gave to us through a, a nine journalist back in the end of 2020, um, you know, those points are non-negotiables. They went to freedom of the press. They went to basic questions of sovereignty around our digital sovereignty, whether or not, uh, you know, we should have Huawei in our future 5G network, for example. So let's see what they put mm -hmm. on the table. And, and um, I would urge the government to always put our national interests first. Are we seeing that happen now with talk that the government has a more of an open mind to take US built submarines? I saw the South Australian Premier pretty cranky about that. He wants them built, of course, at Pork Barrel in Adelaide. But we've got to get the best subs we can and we've got to get them in the water as quickly as we can. I think getting them from the US or, or indeed from the UK built overseas but ready to go is smart politics. Capability must come first, jobs second, capability first. And this is a plan that Peter Dutton argued for several months ago, one that he set in motion as the Minister for Defence. Um, so it, w mm. whichever submarine we go with, whether it's the Stute class out of the UK or the Virginia class out of the USA, we need to be ready to scale up those production lines and get boats in the water as quickly as possible, uh, hopefully within the next decade. This um, attack on Optus, this massive cyber attack, 9 million Australians have got their, their information now out there on the dark web. How concerned are you? I mean, this is a telco technology company. You'd expect them to have uh, the best defences you can have as a corporate citizen. Clearly they did not. Uh, is this a nation state, do you think, involved? We don't know, and that's why we need to hear from the Home Affairs Minister who should be leading this effort. Yes, it was Optus who was responsible, but cybersecurity is a whole of nation uh, challenge for us and government must, must lead and, and provide direction. So let's see what happens. But it took her three days and three quarters of the AFL grand final before she appeared on Twitter and we yet to see a press conference from her. So we want to see action from the government, leadership and coordination, because this, as Peter Dutton said, is potentially the biggest data breach in Australian history. Yeah, I noticed uh, plenty of pressure from the opposition today in question time. Andrew Hastie, thank you for joining us this evening.